Hi, everyone. It's so good to be back online. Let me open the chat and not, let me also put the connection on uh, um, um, YouTube as well, live on YouTube, la la la. There. I hope you are all well. And um, and that you you are uh, quite quite uh, quite sheltered in your houses and your offices um, in order to protect yourself from the sun and the heat. So yes. Um, let's get started, everyone. So um, you may have seen that we are just a little bit of, of news on Krifovi. So we now have some e-commerce services offered on our websites, krifovi.com, which is the English version of our uh, law firm's website, and krifovi.fr, which is the French version. And so we're starting to offer some, um, some, some services through online, through e-commerce. And some of these um, services are subscriptions that monthly subscriptions that our clients can take. And through these subscriptions, one of them is called Crypto's subscription plan. And it, in, it means that you can actually access all our uh, thought leadership uh, content on our websites, such as our articles. So this is a new thing that we've been working very hard on. And so, yes, so do have a look at our stores on crifovi.com and crifovi.fr. And through there, you will be able to subscribe to our online services and in particular receive our weekly newsletter with um, some weekly um, thought leadership articles that are accessible uh, to members. And there is a one day free trial if you want to uh, to um, just test and see whether it's good for you and you like it. So um, um, the uh, latest article that uh, we uh, we released in the public domain was on the Fortet versus uh, Domino Records tr uh, trial. So let's get cracking. Today we're talking about renegotiating. Sorry renegotiating royalties rates on music streams with labels. Uh, what are the best strategies and techniques for all involved? Well, why are we even, you know, uh, asking ourselves this question? Because there's basically quite a lot of movement going on in this uh, area and a lot of tension uh, between um, artists, recording and performing artists and their music labels. And the, the, the background and, and, and is that um, uh, quite a lot of uh, music uh, organizations and uh, such as CZAC, uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, organization based in, um, in uh, uh, Switzerland, I think, and uh, which, which represents various um, offers and composers in the music industry, and also the uh, Standing Committee on Copyright from, from WIPO are just all coming to the same conclusion through their reports that they've been releasing in 2021, the Global Collections Report, etc. And they are just seeing that um, the situation seems to be still very unfair, and uh, it seems to them that um, offers and composers and also um, those, those uh, uh, music uh, artists who are getting some neighboring rights, they are still not making enough money uh, compared to what the uh, publishers, music publishers and the record labels are getting. So today we're mainly going to focus on um, deals relating to uh, neighboring rights and also to uh, to recording artists and the contractual relationships that they have with their music 
uh, labels. And so all these reports are coming out from these federations, organizations, also the IFPI, the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry based in the UK has released also a report engaging with music report in 2021, which shows that basically streaming or just streaming through Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, and, um, and also uh, ad supported audio streamings with, with a free tier um, so, and video streaming such as YouTube and Dailymotion, they are representing now the bulk of the, uh, of the, uh, of, 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 uh, the revenues uh, in, the, in the music industry. So if um, music artists, performing uh, artists uh, and, um, and recording artists don't have a good deal, on streaming income, then it's going to very much affect the uh, uh, basically quality of life and, and their future career because they will want to move on to something else or some super talented kid will actually never decide to become a, um, a performing and recording artist because he or she knows that uh, they won't be able to make a decent living out of it. So even for the, um, the future uh, of the music industry, it is important that recording and performing artists who do represent really the, the main uh, creative uh, basis on, uh, around which the, the music industry is founded. Uh, so recording and performing artists need to feel that uh, they are getting their fair share in terms of uh, streaming income. And so on the back of, 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 of all this, uh, this realization, this, um, uh, this realization that um, uh, streaming income is, is not fairly distributed uh, amongst uh, all stakeholders and um, uh, in particular music artists, musical artists seem to, 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 to be uh, uh, not getting their fair share. There's also um, the Digital Single Market Directive, which was transposed last year in the 27 member states of the European Union, which I'm sure you know now does not include the United Kingdom anymore because they did a Brexit, um, which entered in, into force last year on the 31st of December 2020, 2020 and, um, and um, 1st of January 2021. So, the digital digital single uh, uh, single market directive as is really a um, which has now been as I said transposed in the twenty seven member states or most of them I think the deadline was around June twenty twenty one so we're getting there the twenty seven member states and so it is really a a, a massive reform uh, for the um, uh, music industry in particular because it imposes uh, 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 some transparency provisions as well as some basically uh, principles of appropriate and proportionate remuneration and also even a contract adjustment mechanism and also an, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism as well as a revocation right which all are super favorable to um, performing and recording artists obviously so Coming back to the uh, uh, transparency provision uh, in Article 19 of this uh, Digital Single Market Directive, now um, offers and performers uh, should receive on a regular basis, at least once a year, up-to-date, relevant and comprehensive information on the exploitation of their works and performances from their music publishers and music labels. Um, and on, um, you know, uh, what basically has been exploited, how much general revenues have been generated, how much general remuneration is due at least once a year. So this is an obligation under this, uh, this uh, the DSM, the Digital Single Market Directive. Moreover, uh, so there is this set principle of uh, appropriate and proportionate remuneration uh, in, in Article 18 of the DSM. And um, therefore that means that uh, it, it, it's going to put some pressure on music publishers and music labels to actually ensure that, you know, the percentage split is getting closer to closer, cl closer and closer to 50%, 50%. So 50% to the music label and 50% to the, uh, to the uh, uh, recording and performing artist. This is the direction that it, where it's all going. 
Also, um, a, um, a contract adjustment mechanism is now uh, put in place. It's also referred as the best seller clause in Article 20 of the Digital Single Mar uh, Market Directive. And that means that when um, offers and performers armed with information we obtain through the transparency obligations and or reviewing the, uh, the various uh, publishing contracts and, um, and also uh, recording contracts, offers and perf performers can seek additional appropriate and fair remuneration where the original remuneration is disproportionately low compared to the relevant revenues derived from the subsequent exploitation. And if a, success, a, a renegotiation is unsuccessful with a music label, then creators have the option to bring a claim with a voluntary alternative dispute resolution body, uh, which um, has now been set up in each of the EU member states for this purpose. And uh, also, as I said, this, there's this uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanism, in, uh, which is uh, put, been now uh, uh, set in stone in, in the law in Article 21 of the DSM. And um, um, this is the body, the alternative dispute resolution body, where all these disputes arising from the transparency obligations and the contract adjustment mechanism are being uh, uh, processed and managed by some uh, neutrals, some arbitrators and, uh, and mediators to resolve these disputes with the music labels and the um, uh, recording and, uh, and performing artists. And in case the uh, music label no longer uh, exploits the masters that the um, um, uh, recording artist has, um, has entrusted the label with through an assignment of rights or through a license, then uh, this recording artist has the right to uh, revoke, to, in, it, it has a right to request a revocation of this um, music uh, of his uh, recording agreement with the, uh, the, mu the music label. So um, this is really cool. If you do not exploit my masters while you are the uh, li licensee on this, of this, uh, of this as licensee or the owner for an assignment of his masters, then I am actually terminating this license agreement of his assignment or right, which is the, uh, 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 the recording agreement, and therefore I get my masters back and then I can exploit them again. So this is the revocation right, which is also in the DSM, which is really awesome. So um, yeah, so the 27 member states of the European Union are doing some super awesome things to ensure that the equilibrium in the relationship between the um, uh, record labels and the re recording and performing artists, which used to be like this, label there, recording artists there, are just going back to there. And so in particular, one of the uh, uh, point of contention is the amount of royalties that recording and performing artists are getting paid on the streaming income, which as I said, um, is now recognized as being the most important income for, uh, for uh, artists in the music industry. And so while all this is happening, all this realization, um, um, and all these new advances in, in law uh, and, and economics terms as well as the, in the uh, EU music industry, the UK um, music industry uh, is, is, is quite annoyed because now, uh, because of Brexit, they are out of the EU system and therefore the digital single market directive has not been transposed in the UK. And therefore it means that music labels, UK music labels, and in particular the three big majors, so that's Warner, that's um, Universal and Sony, um, still have the possibility to impose traditional music deals or 360 de degree music deals to their, to their acts and um, with super stringent terms and uh, suffer no repercussions from that. So what the um, policy makers in the UK, some policy makers in the UK have decided to do is to actually put I mean, uh, um, I, I refer you to my article, Reforming UK Music Law, Making the Music Streaming Market Economically Viable for All Stakeholders, which I published earlier this year, I think in March. And in very, it's really detailed, but um, in a nutshell, the House of Commons Digital Culture Media and Sports Committee has issued a report saying, well, 
you know, we need to actually change our ways here and we need to ensure that the legal framework relating to recording and publishing, music recording and, and music publishing agreements um, allow for a renegotiation process, a revocation right, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, some members of this um, House of Commons Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have also uh, uh, created, drafted a bill, which at the moment is following the motions um, in the House of Parliament process to be in, uh, you know, at some point in the future, hopefully, um, uh, turned into a law, uh, and it, which it will be in force in the UK. Um, as I mentioned in my article, though, um, uh, reforming UK music law, I am not too hopeful that the current government uh, will actually um, make this bill uh, proper law. I don't think that this will happen under this uh, this uh, um, particular uh, conservative uh, 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 re regime. So. So the UK music industry, as I was saying, is annoyed, is pissed off because they can't benefit from all these great legal reforms which are happening in the, U the 27 member states of the EU. And, um, and then uh, there is this new case law which has come out um, and uh, which is, which is um, triggered by uh, this UK uh, music uh, artist, recording and performing artist, for Tet. Um, uh, which real name is whose real name, sorry, is Kieran Hebden, who actually filed a, um, a legal claim against his uh, music label, Domino Recording Limited, which is a UK um, independent uh, music label. And therefore, if I'm saying it's independent, it means that it's not related to any major. And so in this Fortet Domino Recording uh, ca case, which I have uh, uh, basically uh, analyzed in detail in our latest article released last week, Fortet versus Domino, why pacific renegotiation of royalties rates on music stream is the best strategy for all in involved. So you can actually read this, um, as I said, either by subscribing to uh, the one day free trial for our subscription um, uh, uh, plans uh, on crefovi.com, on the store of crefovi.com, or on the store of crefovi.fr, to have either the English version or the French version. And then um, after a day, then you will have to subscribe to get these uh, new articles every, every week. And so, um, yeah, so Fortet versus Domino. What, what's the story here? Well, the story is that um, Fortet, so Kieran Hebden signed in 2001, so 20 years ago, a, um, a uh, music uh, a record label, a record agreement, sorry, with his label, Domino Recording. Uh, what he was just, um, he was just starting to get uh, 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 recognized and famous and to have raise his profile. He didn't get any legal advice, naughty boy, before signing the, uh, uh, entering into the, um, uh, the recording agreement that was presented to him by, uh, by his label Domino, he signed. And 20 years later, he wakes up and he's like, why am I only getting 10% or I think it was 12%, 12% of royalties on the um, on the uh, streaming royalties on my uh, 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 for my free uh, uh, albums that I have uh, 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 released through Domino. So these are his um, three main albums as well. But these are the albums which are the most famous ones from Fortet Pause, which was released in 2001, Rounds, released in 2003, and Everything Ecstatic, which was released in 2005. So this was the time, you know, where there's a lot, a lot of EDM and chill and ambiance music. Fortet was full into this, uh, to this groove, into this wave. And these are probably the three titles, the three uh, uh, masters, three albums, which are potentially, uh, which are making the most music stream revenues for him uh, because they have his most famous tracks. So obviously, you know, it was big, a, a, a big point of contention and also a lot was at stake for, for, for Ted, for Kieran Hebden. And I suppose that um, he did the uh, right thing, which is that uh, before lodging some uh, legal claims with, uh, with the courts, the uh, IP uh, courts in, the, in, in, in England, he actually attempted to do some out of court, you know, negotiation of... Uh, 
of um, a, a renegotiation of uh, some of the clauses uh, of his 2001 recording agreement with uh, with Domino and um, they flatly refused they flatly refused to, to, to do the thing that is now an obligation uh, via the digital single market directive in the 27 member states of the EU so that's you know visa comprised Germany France Italy Spain I mean you know and um, and Domino just like decided refused fine and um, and therefore uh, Kieran Hebden had to file a case in court so um, so basically, um, in, eventually the, the parties settled, the parties uh, uh, settled this case, and the way they settled it was quite interesting because they, Domino actually gave to Kieran Hebden, uh, i.e. Fortet, everything that he asked for during, before he had to file some, uh, to lodge some uh, summons. Uh, with the IPEC in, 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 in the UK. And so in particular, they agreed um, to, from now on, provide 50% of the, um, uh, the streaming income to Fortet on, these, uh, on, on the masters, uh, on all the masters. And well, before they were providing, as I said, around 12%. And also they agreed to, uh, to pay him some uh, um, uh, some some post some some previous royalties um, for all the historical streaming and download income from the accounting period going from 2017 to uh, to basically the date on which the uh, this this case was settled and so that's around 50, 57 57 grand uh, in pound in pound sterling so 57 thousand pounds. Um, in relation to these uh, 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 royalties on which they only, only paid, apologies, it wasn't 12%, it was 18%. And um, so they would pay, you know, uh, like uh, 32%, so which is 50 uh, minus uh, 18. So they would, so, so that would compensate for the historical streaming and downloading income that they had not paid 50% on. And um, yeah, yeah, and so and so this is how the claim was uh, was settled. Um, and when I read about this case and I read, read the, um, there was also an, a sort of interim decision uh, judgment which was handed down by uh, a judge in the uh, in the IPEC court, where basically they had uh, uh, she had to decide that judge Judge Tracy um, whether the the, the the fact that Domino Recording had decided to pull out the masters from all the digital uh, streaming platforms, um, Spotify, Deezer, YouTube, etc., um, in it, since there was this disagreement with Fortet about the uh, income streaming, and so the judge had to decide whether uh, it was fair for Fortet to actually amend his statement of claim in view of the retaliation and um, bad faith attitude, according to Fortet, um, uh, used by um, uh, Domino uh, recording in uh, well, when they pulled, removed all these uh, masters from the uh, streaming platforms, which means that, of course, there was no more streaming income, for, neither for uh, the music label nor for the artist. Uh, which was definitely a lose-lose scenario. Uh, and that was also a way of pressurizing Fortet in stopping his request of having a, a fair share on the music streaming income. So at the end of the day, uh, the judge, so that was, as I said, pre-settlement, of course. Uh, um, at, at the end of the day, the judge, Judge Tracy from the IPEC court ruled in this uh, sort of interim ruling that it was fair for Fortet, so the claimant, to actually amend his statement of claim in view of these new facts where the defendant, his label, uh, Domino, had actually removed all the streams from um, DSPs from digital service providers. So anyway, uh, we can see that a lot is happening in relation to this debate, this this uh, um, this this uh, uh, point of contention on how to actually divide um, and spread the uh, streaming income 
uh, coming from the exploitation of his masters on digital digital service platforms such as Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, etc. Um, and um, and now I would like to move on to the point where. Um, I, I don't need le give legal advice because uh, none of you guys are any of my clients, but I'm just giving some directions. Uh, um, and also, I, I don't know what the particulars of, of, your pro of, of your personal situations are and circumstances are, but I, I'm just going to now give some sort of general uh, pointers and things that need to be you know, taken care of before and during a negotiate renegotiation of um, of the um, uh, the share um, and the split of income on the uh, on the digital uh, and, and streams. Um, so, as a as a, a, a music performer, as a as a, a performing artist and recording artist. If you decide to go through the motions of uh, of um, renegotiating your your deal, so to speak, with your music label, and um, this is uh, irrespective of the fact that you are based in either in the UK or in one of the twenty seven member states of uh, uh, the European Union, and in particular France, you need to come really prepared, okay, before you sit at the table and to make your request to your music label. So when I, I, I say you need to be uh, prepared, I mean, you need to actually know the uh, content of your uh, recording agreement. You need to know it inside out. You need to know whether your recording agreement is either a traditional deal, a um, net profit deal, or a 360 degree deal. So you're going to ask, what is she on about? Well, what I am on about is detailed friends in my article which is called modern methods of monetization for independent and major record labels 360 degree and beyond and that is also a, an article that you can uh, read and review in um, our uh, publications which um, you can uh, have access to if you become a subscriber um, by subscribing on our stores on crefovi.com and crefovi.fr, okay? Um, so, in a nutshell, a traditional deal is a deal that where, where the music label is going to get 50% of all the income streams, okay? In exchange, well, they will have a super big magnitude um, and ability to uh, do a lot of marketing for your, uh, for your uh, album, for your masters, and for you as a, as a, 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 not a, a performing artist, uh, they will have, so, so usually um, traditional deals are actually entered into by the mu music labels, uh, sorry, the major music labels, Universal, Sony, and, and Warner, because they are so strong, right? And um, um, they could also give you, most of the time, a traditional deal comes with an advance. So the label gives you some money in advance while you are preparing your masters. And then when the masters are being released and um, are making, generating money through incomes, then this advance is recouped from the um, uh, income generated by exploiting the masters. And um, there are also tons of perks that a traditional deal comes with, but the cost is that, um, did I say 50%? I'm afraid I made a mistake. Um, what I meant was that the, um, under a traditional deal, um, the uh, artist usually gets between, let's say 10 and 15, so one zero and one five, 10 to 15% of all the sales, um, and um, and uh, the, the label gets rest, okay? So uh, we're looking at um, 80 to, uh, yeah, I mean, 75 to, to, to 85%. So, um, so yeah, the traditional deal uh, means that 
while you are getting all these perks, the advance, the great press coverage, the great PR, the prestige of, uh, of having um, Universal or Warner or Sony as a label, the cost is that your royalty rates on all the sales is going to be only between 10 and 15, sometimes 18% max. Um, and that, that is um, quite, um, quite low. Uh, compared to a net profit deal. And a net profit deal is usually signed between a uh, performing and recording uh, artist and um, music labels, which are in the independent category, such as Domino Recording. And um, uh, on these type of net profit deals, where there will be much less you know, PR and uh, massive amount of money, uh, 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 basically, uh, flushed by the, uh, the independent label into, uh, into the marketing campaign, and the ad campaign. Yes, there would be less of that, but at least you as a, a music performer, you get 50% on all sales, okay? And so when I'm talking about sales, I'm talking sales of vinyls, sales of um, uh, CDs, sales of, um, uh, uh, you know, all these type of products. And, um, and so 50% for the label and 50% for the artist on the net profit deal, okay? And then, as I was saying, there's the uh, third alternative, which is the 360-degree deal. What is that? Well, it is a traditional deal, so 10 to 18% split for the uh, uh, um, uh, music performer, the rest goes to the label. So it's a traditional deal, the 360-degree deal, Plus, it also requires from the music performer to get a share of his or her income on all of the revenue streams, such as uh, live performance, touring, okay, um, merchandising, um, any TV uh, um, um, performance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the 360-degree deal is called like that because it means it's on all income streams. Everything is included in the deal. OK, um, so, yeah, as I was saying, coming back to my point of earlier, you if you want to renegotiate your uh, royalties rate on the music stream of your label, you actually need to read in details, uh, even if need be with your uh, with with a, uh, a music lawyer that you need to appoint you know, and instruct if you if you feel that this is necessary and clarify whether what you have signed, sometimes at age you know, 18, when we're just start, starting to become famous, um, is a traditional deal or a net profit deal or a 360 degree deal, okay? So you need to clarify this. And then to go deeper into this, the clause, into, the, um, into the, um, the content of this recording agreement, you need to look, look in details at what is set out on uh, uh, the in the provisions relating to the split for uh, streaming and uh, digital downloads. A lot of, uh, as I was saying before, for sales, so sales on vinyls, on CDs, on um, uh, um, usually, um, in a traditional deal, the split is 10 to 18% for the artist maximum, and the rest is for the uh, uh, record label. So why, 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 is the, why is it like this? Why? But because before uh, uh, streams became so, so, so prominent, uh, the um, mainstream way of distributing music was through actually uh, cassettes and CDs and vinyls, right? And since they were physical objects, they actually cost quite a lot of money to be manufactured and produced. So that was the um, rationalization. That was the reason why the labels were saying, yeah, but you know, we're spending so much time, you know, paying the manufacturers for them to actually make the cassettes, the vinyls and the, um, and the, um, the CDs, that it actually makes sense that we get 80% of this income back. You know, on the on the sales of his uh, of his uh, products, so that was the uh, that was the rationalization of such a split on sales before. But then, what happens with um, uh, with um, with streams? Streams are, <coughs> by definition and by nature, uh, virtual. They are intangible. 
because you know they are digital streams. So there aren't any manufacturers uh, involved in this process of uh, distributing streams. So are we going to treat them as sales, these streams, or are we going to treat them as licenses? Because in most traditional deals uh, um, in, in, in recording uh, agreements, licenses are actually uh, split, the royalties on licenses are actually split 50% um, at fifty percent between the um, musical artist and the and the uh, label and his or her label. So there's this whole debate about whether a music stream, a digital stream, is a sale or a license. And this is a very critical point because if it's a sale um, under a traditional deal, the artist gets only 10 to 18%. And if it's a license, the artist gets 50%. And of course, what did most music labels do uh, when the market turned around and um, CDs became redundant and obsolete and cassettes were you know, obsolete like 20 years ago. Um, and so what did the um, uh, big players in the industry do? Uh, they, they actually said, well, streams, nah, they sales. They're not licenses, what are you talking about? So especially in the US around 10 years ago, quite a lot of artists uh, who were signed into traditional deals um, actually sued their record label, um, the majors in particular. So I refer you to the, um, um, you know, the case uh, started by Eminem, who uh, uh, negotiated very hard with his label to uh, ensure that he would get more than, you know, 18% on the streams. Um, and he basically renegotiated his, uh, his recording, uh, traditional deal uh, recording agreement with the major he signed with in order to ensure that he would get much closer to 50%, 5-0 on streams, because he understood 10 years ago that this is where the future was going, okay? The future was going to music, music streams, definitely not uh, uh, towards uh, CDs and physical, um, physical medias on which music would be released. So um, um, other acts uh, such as, you know, Simon Fuller, sorry, um, uh, Weird uh, Al Yankovic also um, renegotiated his, uh, his uh, royalty split on musical streams with his label and also some manage managers for uh, acts such as the Spice Girls, etc. So Simon Fuller, who managed the uh, the Spice Girls, um, he also, you know, went uh, straight in and uh, renegotiated for his acts that he had on the management, the, uh, uh, the royalty rate for uh, music, the, the music streams. Um, so that was then 10 years ago, okay? And what baffles me, especially when we, you know, we, we hear about this Fortet versus Domino case, is that we are 10, 15 years down the line, We've been through a pandemic where um, musical acts had no ability to actually go out there and do some live touring and some live concerts and touring. So therefore they couldn't get any, um, any uh, income from uh, uh, concerts and, uh, and live performances and touring. And yet um, dinosaur record labels such as uh, Domino Recordings are still reflecting refusing to renegotiate the royalty rate on music streams. I mean, hello, this is so, um, in, uh, like, in view of a context that I've described before, the digital single market, which um, was transposed in, um, in the neighboring countries of the UK um, uh, uh, last year and this year, and, you know, all these reports coming out from all the top music federations saying artists are not being paid enough on streams, artists are not being paid enough on streams. How can Domino Recording still take a stance that um, it's actually best to go to court and litigate on this? It's, it's just baffling to me. So coming back to your best strategy as a music uh, uh, artist, you need to review this clause on your recording agreement in relation to what the split is um, between your label and yourself in relation to music streams and da digital downloads, okay? You need to review it. What does it say, okay? And so um, if it's a traditional deal, probably it will be treated as a sale. 
and your uh, right according to this agreement is going to be 10, between 10 and, 15, and 18 percent. Okay, uh, if it's a net profit deal, it's probably going to be 50 percent. Okay, if you are signing to a net profit deal, and if it's a 360 degree deal, it's probably going to say um, 10 to 15 percent uh, for you as a as a music uh, as a recording artist. And also look at the date. I mean, if this uh, uh, recording agreement was signed. 30 years ago, um, it's, um, it's quite possible uh, that, that it, 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 it just contains, sets out a lot of clauses which, which are completely obsolete and old and, uh, and no longer apply to this market, yet it is still the uh, agreement which binds you with your recording uh, uh, label. So what do you do, even though the clauses in there are completely obsolete and, and dinosaur-like? Um, well, you have to find a solution, hence the need, need to actually renegotiate, okay? So basically, you need to do all this audit, either by yourself, and due diligence, either by yourself, if you feel that you've got the technical music savvy, sorry, business savvy and legal knowledge to pull this off, or with your counsel, with your legal counsel, music counsel, he or she needs to be a, a, a music uh, a lawyer specialized in the music industry um, and you need to do this audit before you speak to your to your label okay otherwise you won't come across as credible and you will waste time and energy and like Fortet you will end up in litigation okay once you've done that uh, you also the, the uh, audit and due diligence you also need to ask yourself okay so who actually owns my publishing here if the company I'm signed with for the record, you know, the masters, so the recording agreement um, is signed with a major, okay, there's a very high probability that the publishing um, side of this major is also going to manage my, um, my publishing on this particular so songs tracks that I have composed, written, because I'm a performing artist as well as a a composer, writer, okay? It can happen, lots of uh, acts uh, both compose, uh, 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 write, and as well as perform. Think Ed Sheeran, uh, Adele, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so for example, well, like, let's give you a, a practical example. I'm with Universal. I am with Universal Recording uh, for uh, re records or one of a imprint at, uh, at Universal uh, 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 on the labels, label side. And therefore I have a recording deal with Universal. But I also have um, my publishing for all these um, uh, music compositions um, managed by uh, Universal Music Publishing on the publishing side, right? So this is, Obviously, perhaps not exactly the same legal entity, but at the top um, on the, um, you know, the parent company is, is universal, okay? So why am I saying this? Because you need to see whether you're going to take some uncalculated risk by trying to renegotiate your recording agreement with universal, while if uh, universal music publishing, your publisher knows about it, well, they might actually be quite annoyed that you are trying to uh, um, renegotiate your, uh, your, your uh, record deal. And this could actually, you know, sour the relationship with your music publisher as well. Okay, so what I'm saying is that you need to actually calculate the risk, you know, what are the um, pros and cons of me renegotiating these uh, royalties rates on my music streams? Um, I mean, there, there is definitely a big case for it at the moment um, in view of the whole context and changes happening in the music industry, especially in the EU. But am I taking quite a lot of risk because um, there's a relationship between my music label and my music publisher? And therefore, if I um, get um, in, you know, in, in a confrontation with my music label, this could have a repercussion on my relationship with my music publisher and I could actually, you know, lose from that as well. So, you see, you need to really strategize here and think hard before you actually um, pull the trigger and uh, and uh, reach out to your to the CEO at your at your music label and say, 
bang, bang on the table. I want a better deal. 10%, not good. I want 50. You know, that's a steep climb, 10 to 15, to 50, five zero. Uh, but um, yeah, but it is what it is. I mean, um, thinking about the future, uh, I, I don't think that the record labels are going to be able to pull this off much longer, you know, keeping their acts on, uh, on a, um, uh, a royalty rate of 10 to 18 percent max for music streams in this day and age, in this economy, um, in, in view of how the market is going. I, I don't think that they'll be able to do it. I mean, what I've been reading in the press, for example, in relation to Domino Recordings, this music label who uh, refused to enter into any negotiation with Fortet about uh, uh, renegotiating the uh, uh, royalty rate on music streams, well, their reputation got super damaged. And it was the same actually 10 years ago when the likes of uh, um, Universal and Warner or whatever, refused to actually, I mean, initially resisted the reneg renegotiation of, uh, of um, string royalty rates with the likes of Eminem, Simon Fuller, and uh, we had uh, uh, Al Yankovic. So, um, so yeah, this is, you get a, a, a PR dis disaster when you, you react like this and you absolutely flat, flatly refuse to uh, engage into any re negotiation of, uh, of the royalty rates. So the future, I think, is bright for uh, music performer, performers and, um, and recording artists, but they need to come prepared and um, they need to be able to impress uh, the other side, so the music label and the legal team, but not only that, they also need to be able to impress a eventual and possible judge in front of the IPEC court, the intellectual property court in the UK, in case the negotiation doesn't work out and they have to pull off a fortet and actually go to court and file some summons in court against their label. So what you have to think at the back of your head when you're doing that negotiation and you're doing the due diligence of the audit is, am I acting in a way which a judge of the IPEC court would think is a fair and reasonable uh, 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 strategy to renegotiate my royalty rate of music streams. And I can guarantee you, now that I've read you know, the judgment from uh, Justice Tracy, um, which she handed down, I think in January, 2022, um, called, uh, so I was, uh, yeah, Mr. Kieran Hebden and Domino Recording Company Limited. And so this is like a 24 pages judgment um, written in rather complex English um, and, um, and with a lot of la 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 um, and, 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 you know, convoluted ways of, of expressing an idea or, or a point or an argument. And, um, and yeah, it's super formal, okay? So, so you have to ask yourself, um, am I, you know, building a case here uh, so that I will have some, I'm maximizing my chances of winning if I actually have to file some summons against my music label in court, okay? With a judge from the IPEC division. For example, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, be prepared, uh, be rigorous in your approach. Get some appropriate legal advice if you think that this is uh, uh, this is needed, even when you are merely doing a renegotiation behind closed doors with your label. Sometimes it's actually better to already have a a, a music lawyer on, on your side straight away, even before litigation, and um, and then you know go with it because. I, I really do think that the position of uh, dinosaur labels like Domino Recordings um, is going to fade away. This is, they, they, they will uh, win time, uh, uh, they, they will lose total credibility in, in having this sort of imbecile approach in the future. But if you want to do the renegotiation now in the present, you have to follow, uh, I mean, I would strongly suggest that you follow everything, uh, uh, all the general, uh, you know, advice I've just given just now. So 
I am done with my presentation, guys. And I was wondering if you had any questions at this point in time. If you do, don't hesitate to unmute yourself and ask your questions. I'm uh, here to answer any uh, questions you may have in this Q&A. So let me have a look at our, uh, our comments in, uh, YouTube, in YouTube. So um, Amelia is asking, I have a, uh, a record agreement with a, um, an indie and um, they refuse to uh, renegotiate the royalties rate on uh, music streams. Although I have asked quite a few times that they increase it from 12% to uh, 50. What do I do? Um, give us a call. Give us a call. We we'll, would we'll be uh, delighted to um, uh, review the contract for you and with you and to advise you on the uh, you know, uh, on the uh, uh, exact aspect of your cases and um, and um, and the best approach to uh, uh, resume this uh, renegotiation of a rate with your with your label. Um, as I said, a position where they uh, refuse in the long term to renegotiate such uh, such rates on income streams is going to become completely unsustainable and uh, an, an enormous damage to any uh, label's reputation. But um, we are talking about now, we're talk not talking about in five or 10 years time. So, uh, so yeah, I think the best, the best way for you to approach this is to, uh, is, uh, to get proper legal advice and, um, and um, we can do that. Okay, no further questions. So thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure to, uh, um, to um, do this presentation for you today and um, talk to you later. <laughs>